yes. ambition to be on it, yes. And there I was. Really? Oh, it's my, yes. What, from when you were little? Oh, yes, yes. Really? Yeah, I absolutely loved it, yes, yes. That was your ambition, was to... Well, it sounds pathetic, doesn't it? But <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> um, yes, when I was a little thing. Because I got all the annual, every year I got the annual in my stocking, and I read, I read all the paper oh. about the Target books. And, um, yeah, no, I was the number one Doctor Who fan in my town. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, no, You're I... You're cool. And, uh, <laughs> You're clearly very cool. <laughs> well, then, yeah, of course, in those days it wasn't cool at all. Now it's a bit cool, which is quite odd, really. I don't like it being cool. I think there's something wrong with it. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, no, it definitely wasn't cool then. But, no, I was. I was very into it. So it was, it was fab. It was absolutely bizarre and surreal being, being cast in it. Very young, completely out of the blue. Yes, it, but yes, no, it was, it was my dream job. I know it sounds a bit silly, but it actually was. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people out there would, uh, would certainly empathise with that. Uh, but how did you go from being the number one fan in your hometown to being on the show? Charm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I've, done an, I've, done, I've been in a serial for the BBC. Um, so I was around, the, I'd done this public school serial, so I was around, and um, some little newspaper article said that Doctor Who was looking for a sort of artful dodger. He was described as a sort of alien artful dodger. So I told the BBC casting director, who had already cast me in something else, that I would love, 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 love her to put me up for it. She sent off my little photograph. And I was so, I was so new at it, I didn't even have a 10 by 8. It was a little passport-sized photograph, actually, that she sent off to John Nathan Turner. And, um, and then I didn't hear anything, so I actually telephoned the office, the Doctor Who office, because, but, but to speak to the secretary, who I didn't know. But as it happens, John Nathan Turner actually picked the phone up which was absolutely terrible. It took me a minute or two to realise it was John Nathan to pick the phone up. So there I was, sort of telling the producer of Doctor Who that I wanted to be in his programme, which I wouldn't do now, I have to say. But um, it was a very innocent thing. It wasn't sort of pushy or anything, because I thought I would speak to the secretary. I was going to yeah. say, oh, have you looked at my photograph yet? Is there any chance? But there it was, John Nathan Turner, and um, he said, oh, yes, come in, my boy. Come in to our <laughs> read for me. And I went and read, and Chris Bidmead was there, and Peter Moffat was there, and then I got the phone call a couple of days later. It, but it was very strange, very fast, very out of the blue. And, yeah, I did have my dream job, yes, strangely, I did, yes. Sarah, you'd, you'd been working since you were six, is that right? Uh, seven. Seven. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> since you were seven. But no, actually, uh, that's, no, that's not true, actually. Uh, nine. And was that the role in Winnie the Pooh? That was Winnie the Pooh. I played Baby Roo in Winnie oh. the Pooh at the Phoenix Theatre in Tottenham Court Road. Music by Julian Slade. It was, um, it was a great experience. I thought I just had the best childhood going up to London every day on the train and doing two shows a day and everything. I thought it was a really pretty good life. Yeah. <laughs> so. And you spent your, obviously, a lot of your childhood, your teens, mm. acting. Yeah. Um, coming back to that initial question, though, of... Doctor Who, was that something that you were obviously aware of, but were interested <coughs> in being in? Um, I was aware of Doctor Who. I don't think there was anyone who wasn't aware of Doctor Who, but it wasn't something I have to say I particularly watched. I was, I was not a number one fan in my town. <laughs> and, um, but <coughs> just before I went to the audition, I went on holiday with my parents, and um, I remember sitting there on, on the beach thinking, what would I like to do? I know it would be good fun. Because I'd always played, um, how ironic is this really, that I'd always played sort of been in a lot of period dramas and um, lots of you know pretty frocks and stuff. And I thought, well, I'm a teenager and I'd like to do something a bit more gritty and a bit more, a bit more modern. I thought, and I thought Doctor Who would be a good idea. And I literally, I got home and my agent rang and said they'd like to see you for an episode of Doctor Who. And I thought, well, how cool is that? And I just suddenly thought about it and there it was. But as it turned out, Nyssa ends up being quite a sort of regal, old fashioned -y type of character. And so I was probably back playing what I always <laughs> trying to get away from. Well, um, yeah, I mean, your, your, your um, purple dress was kind of a bit Elizabethan, wasn't it? Yes, I mean, it was about it was, as period as it could possibly yeah. be while still and being And the sets of track and were all yes. very beautiful. And, uh, and you have yeah. visions of being the, the sort of the contemporary girl yes. being whisked off into yeah, with, history. Yeah, and yeah exactly. Future. But right. it didn't actually work out like that. So maybe that's just what I'm meant to play. <laughs> 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 and Terry, yourself... Um, so where about in your career did Doctor Who come? How long have you been acting at that stage? Um, gee, um, 70, about 10 years, right. I suppose. Um, I'd sort of hacked around doing theatre jobs. I mean, in fact, I didn't, you know, I, I wanted to be a musician, actually. That's what I wanted to do. I played in the soul band in Liverpool in the 60s and um, played the cabin and places like that. 
<coughs> and um, you know that's really what I wanted to do, but I drifted into acting because there seemed to be slightly more security in it than there was in the music <laughs> business. Um, so yeah, and uh, coming from a theatrical family, it uh, kind of seemed natural. Um, but I'd just been working in rep and stuff like that, and, and round and about, and hadn't done really any telly because I didn't have an agent. I didn't. I was totally naive about the business. You know, I was just getting jobs as and when people offered me jobs. You know, and I'd done a telly down in. Um, at TVS, and one of the directors on that, which was a series, we did about six months doing a thing called Radio Phoenix, and uh, one of the directors on that was, um, was Matthew Robinson, um, who then rang me up, because he'd been asked to take over Resurrection of the Daleks, and he rang me up and said, do you know anything about Doctor Who? I said, yeah, I uh, used to watch it a bit when, you know, William Hartnell was in it, you know. Uh, he said, do you know anything about the Daleks? I said, yeah, yeah I think I know about them. He said, do you know anything about Davros? I said, I haven't a clue. <laughs> so he said, well, come and have a look at these tapes. And so that was it, really. Um, but it was, for me, it was just another job. I just thought, oh, that's good. Yeah, lovely. I mean, I had no preconceptions about Doctor Who. I hadn't seen it since Hartnell days, um, really, or beginning of Troughton. Um, so I didn't know where it was or how big it had become. Um, I just sort of came along to do this part and... and and I thought, that's it, two weeks and I'll be off and away, you know, which it was, you know, until JMT asked me to come back and do it again, and then come back and do it again, and, um, you know, until they got rid of the whole programme. And here we are. And here we all are, these, all these years later, yeah, who'd have known? It's funny, actually, obviously, at conventions, you hear people say time and time again, oh, it was just a, a small part of my career, or it was just, a, you know, just yeah. a, another acting job. But obviously, for, for you guys, more than anyone else we've had here today, really, it's become part of your lives. You were regulars, you were a returning character. It's quite a, a big question, I suppose, but what do you think you've gained from your association with Doctor Who? Well, that's like a GCSE question, isn't it? Mm. What did you get? Right on, uh, right on both sides of the paper at once. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a lot of friends, actually. Yes, a lot I of think, friends I, think, yeah. I never expected to, to have. Um, uh, and a feeling of Belonging to yeah. belonging to something yeah. and belonging to a club and a lot of people I I never actually work with on the show and yet we all seem we all to know we each, know each yeah. other as if we had it is a big family it is like being part of a giant extended um, family yeah. well, in which I include those people who are fans and I got a lot of lot of friends in 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 the fan world you know who I see regularly at, at events and things and we share Twitter things occasionally and um, yeah it's it, it, it's a common experience which I think unites us mm. all whether we were working together or whatever. If you're in the programme or watch the programme, it's, it's common ground. I mean, I'd like to say that it, it was a good launch for my career. In fact, my career went like that. After. <laughs> so I can't say that it was, you know, that it was a huge positive for me in that respect. But I don't blame Doctor Who for that. There's all sorts of other things that, that, that were happening. And, and, and partly me, I just wasn't, I lost a lot of my ambition. And um, it just didn't, didn't carry on for me. But, um, but I look back on it very fondly, and I think it's lovely to come here today, and I, was, I get nervous, and then I come and I see old faces and old friends, and it's kind of like the nerves go then, because you think, well, I'm, I'm part of something. I think, you know, I think we like to think there's, a, there's this uh, camaraderie of Doctor Who girls there. Yeah. Does that really exist? Yeah. Does it? Yeah, mm. I think so. And do you feel like an honorary Doctor Who girl? Oh, yes, totally. <laughs> <laughs> So do I. Or do you and Mark just get together and you know, go Oh, yes, yes, really. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, yes. Anyway, what, what did you want what to What are we talking about? Um, what do you think you might have gained from your, your association with Well, you know, the thing about a programme I, I, that you become associated with very young is that your life as a result of it is entirely different. It's very difficult to say what my life would have been like without it. Mm. It is absolutely life-changing. Uh, when I left Doctor Who, I actually did quite a lot of work. I mean, I worked in theatre for years and years until I moved to the States. Um, but what I'm known for is Doctor Who. Uh, that's what people know my name for, know my face for. And that's just a fact. Um, so I think it's impossible to trace what the alternatives would have been. Mm -hmm. Because once you've done something like that and you're so strongly associated with it, it just stays. It stays around uh, and still does, which I don't mind at all. I've never minded. Um, but it's impossible to imagine what, yeah. if I had gone a more orthodox route, become the sort of character actor that I essentially am. Uh, and as I say, I did quite a lot of work as a character actor uh, in theatre. 
Um, but it would have been a completely different career. It would have been a completely different life, really. I and mean, even the, living in the States, you know, I got a green card because I was in Doctor Who. The re you know, reason I could go and live with my partner is because I happened to be in Doctor Who, which was it made me enough of a star to get a green card. Uh, so my life is affected by all sorts of ways that are... That, that are difficult to, to read, difficult yeah. to trace, really. Unexpected it's huge. Ways. Yeah, for all of us, I think, but particularly those of us who were in it for a long time, it's, it's there all the time. Um, you were talking about you know, meeting up with old friends and familiar faces. Um, Matthew, last weekend, you... <laughs> you met up with a new old face, which is a bad way of describing it. You met Bonnie Langford, is what I'm trying yes, to say. Yes, fabulous Bonnie Langford, yes. You no, we're first a fan time. of Bonnie Langford, yes. No, she's very sweet. I like her a lot. She's funny and she's cool. You, you must have something in common. I've never met her before. Have you not met Bonnie? I've before? never met her before, no. no. I think so. yeah, funny, <coughs> your paths haven't crossed before. Yeah, um, yeah. But you must both have common ground in the fact that, um, you know, obviously your permanent base is the States now, and, and Bonnie spent a lot of time, mm. particularly in the last several years, working out in America. Mm. Um, I don't even know where I'm going with that one. No, <laughs> I don't either. She's had an amazing career. She's had an amazing career. She has. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. She and I used to go up for parts. Mm. Same parts. Um, yeah. We're a similar age, so we both auditioned for Gypsy in the West End, um, which I didn't get. Does, does that, okay, as, as actors, um, does that tend to happen quite a lot, that there are certain types of actors they're looking for, so you, you see the same faces Well, certainly auditions. when I was younger, mm. we were, Bonnie, myself, and there was a handful of others, were a big fish in quite a small pond. And when, when you get older, there's suddenly, you know, there's thousands. As a child, you, there are not that many of you. So. But she was, she's much more singing and dancing. I, I, don't, I don't sing. Anyone's heard me sing? Like that. I, don't <laughs> uh, I, can, I can dance a bit, or I, I could, but certainly not in the way Bonnie can. So we were, she was much more sort of singing dancing. I went more on the plain drama side, so um, that's where our differences came in. Actually, a friend of a friend, it turns out, <laughs> when I was an, an actress, I know who I was working with at the time, about 15 years ago, and she mentioned she had a friend who apparently had gone up for all the jobs that I got, and my name was Mud in his house. <laughs> he actually went up for Adric, and he went up for two or three theatre jobs that I got in the next two or three years after that. So, um, and she mentioned this to me. She said, I mentioned you, and he went all sort of frosty. And said, he got all the parts I went up for. Yeah. I, 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 I'm constantly meeting Johnny Depp at casting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, come on, give me a break, <laughs> will you? You know. <clears throat> but I'm actually, funny enough, I, 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 I tend to spend my career taking over from people. Right. Um, and in fact, a, <clears throat> a director threw me a backhanded compliment once. He said, you know, Terry, you're the last person I think of when I'm casting. I said, oh, thank you. She said, but you're the first person I think of when I'm in trouble. <laughs> I mean, I, would, I took over in, in Doctor Who, took over from Mike Risher, uh, <coughs> took over in The Archers, the character I play in The Archers, I took over from that. And I've taken over several theatre jobs from, you know, people that have been doing it, you know, established people. So, uh, uh, and what he said at the end was, he said, the problem is you're too versatile. Mm. You don't project just one thing which we could hook on to. And I said, well, that's okay, I don't mind, I'm, you know. It's rather well, short-sighted, isn't it, really? Yeah, I just like doing lots of different things, you know, so um, that's, that's cool, you know. So. You, you just mentioned the Archers, I just yeah. want to go with that for a moment. Um, how long have you been doing the Archers for now? Would you believe in October it would be 40 years? <gasps> wow. No, 40 years. <laughs> how bizarre. old is the show itself? Uh, the show is uh, 42 years. Uh, no, <coughs> <it's>, uh, <laughs> the show's been going since 51, so um, it's 63 years. 63 years, 63 yeah. years. Yeah. Good. And I've been in it 40 years. But you don't know, I see, I don't know, because you're not doing it every day. It's not like Crossroads or something yeah. that you're in every flipping day. You, you couldn't know. do it for that no, many years. No, you couldn't do it. Drive me potty. Uh, and we're only in every, you know, once a month, you know, at, if we're in at all, you know, because sometimes it can go six, eight months without <coughs> an episode, you know, um, and without being paid. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, I think the only time I was really aware of the time passing was... Uh, about 20 years ago when they auditioned for my son, Roy, to come in, you know, and um, we had these actors in and I was doing the auditions with them and the final one, Ian Pepple, came in and started talking and the hairs went up on the back of my neck. I thought, blimey, that's my voice, uh -huh. 20 years ago. That's really clever, isn't it? Yeah, you think, oof, 
you know, but then I thought, my God, I've been in it for 20 years, you know. And that was the first time I'd even noticed time passing, because you don't, you know. You, I, I joined it when I was 24 and, you know, just carried on doing it. You know. And just the one character. You, it's oh, yeah, four, yeah, yeah. It's always been, yeah, Mike, Mike Tucker, yeah, I haven't, I haven't changed. My but, father was a big Archers fan, and um, when he went, he got increasingly deaf, so that the archers would literally, he would turn the archers on and the whole house would shake. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. There's, there's nothing actually that is more guaranteed to make me feel English than the archers theme tune. Mm. And I, 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 don't, I tend to put Radio 4 on when I'm decorating, so maybe only a couple of weeks of the year <laughs> and I'll listen to the archers for that sort of two week period of decorating the kitchen. Um, but do you, think it, do you think it'll ever end? No. Or do you think it's... No, no, no. no. I mean, Billy Connolly said that they should, they should change the national anthem to the Archers theme tune. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so at least everybody knows the words. You know. yeah. um, but no, it's, it's an institution now. I mean, yeah. it's, um, you know, it, it, no, it's, no, I don't think so. And, and because they've been very clever, you see, they didn't fall into the traps that Mrs. Dale's diary did of having no children. You know, they're always bringing in the mm. next generation, you know. Mm. And I, I realised I came in as this youngster <clears throat> you know, and all these old farts were around there, and now I'm the old fart, you know, and all these youngsters are coming through, and we're all sitting there saying, they've got all these youngsters in the programme, it's ridiculous, you get rid of all these youngsters, why don't we have an outbreak of meningitis and get rid of all the kids? <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, sadly, no. Um, yeah, and that's, the cl that's the, one of the clever things that they've done, they always maintain the generations, so it will, the next generation are being fed in to take over, and it suddenly appear. I just want to ask you one more thing about the artist, yeah, and no, I'll no. return to the world of Doctor Who. Please. Um, the, obviously, a lot of people are talking at the moment about the, the end of TV Centre. Yeah. I'm um, looking back with great nostalgia. You went through that a few years ago with Pebble Mill. Yeah, closing we did indeed, do, you, yeah. do you look at Pebble Mill with nostalgia, or, or do you think, oh, thank God we're in the mailbox? Not very much building. so. No, oh, God, no. Yeah, very much so. I mean, at Pebble Mill is where I learnt my craft at Retina Radio. I mean, most of my work has been in radio, in audio. And that's where I learnt my craft, and the memories of that building are just immense, you know. Uh, I mean, the mailbox is a sterile place. It's got no heart, and it's got less and less heart as it has gone on. There's nobody there now. Mm. They have these tours of people going, paying 20 quid to go have a tour of the BBC. <laughs> well, this is where Coast used to be, <coughs> empty desks, and this is where Country File used to be, empty desks. They all want a press call, you know, and uh, this, is, um, this is the newsroom, and this is where they do the arches, and... Um, well, I hope you've enjoyed the short tour. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> you know, and that's, there's, it's an empty building with Midlands Today, The Archers, and Radio WM. That's it. Everything else is gone. I mean, I don't know how long it'll stay there. I mean, we, we have, you know, thoughts it might be long before we're shifted to either Salford or okay. Cardiff or right. Bristol. Or, you know, but anyway, we'll see. Right, I'll return to Dr. Move Who. Move on, please. We'll return to Dr. Who. Um, Matthew and Sarah, you, you both came into the show in quite a turbulent time for the lead actor. Um, as the new <coughs> assistants, were you made to feel welcome on the show? I thought assistant was uh, no longer the fashionable oh, word. Sorry. But it was now companion. On PC. Yes, we decided that we weren't assistants, were we? We were companions. <coughs> um, yeah, no. Uh, yeah, very difficult time. Yeah, no, not, not very jolly when I arrived. No, it was all a bit Why? stressful and difficult. Well, Tom had become very, very, very difficult. I mean, much more difficult than, than he was on Keeper of Trial. Really? Oh, yeah, you may have thought that was the ultimate <laughs> difficult. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, no. Any stories before what did, where I joined, did you join? How many I was in three stories. Oh, okay. A trilogy, actually a linked trilogy. Oh, I thought you'd been there donkey's years. Well, I, yeah, <laughs> well, I acted like a Felt like that. <laughs> yes. No, yeah, three. But uh, no, no, Tom was very, very, very difficult. In a sweet way. I mean, I, you know, I, I've got some affection for him. And, and um, I wrote a book which has a great deal about him in as humorous and, and affectionate. But, but he was very, and he's been very honest about it. I have to say, Tom has been very honest in the years since about how difficult he had become. Uh, by the, in the last two or three years, I think, uh, he had become very difficult. So when you joined, did Tom know that he was going? How, what, not, no, not as far as I'm oh, aware. Yes. He knew fairly soon after, but no, because not course, the I day joined, I arrived. Then he would have yes. known that he was yes. going, so maybe that's where the change was. Maybe he was slightly yes. relieved then. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, no, he didn't know. Sorry, No, um, no. Um, <laughs> but... Um, yeah, as I say, he's been very honest about this in the years since, that, that, that he had become 
very, very difficult. When I had a poster of him on my wall the day I was, uh, I started rehearsal, and I didn't by the end of the day. I think. <laughs> <laughs> you did have to dance to it, yeah. Well, <laughs> um, have you? Have you found he's mellowed over the years? I know that Louise has recently described him as a pussycat, which she, she said she couldn't believe she's using those terms about Tom Baker. Well, of course, she found him very difficult as in, in the, on the television programme. She found him very difficult. But yes, no, he, he, he's turned into a little soft-hearted old thing, apparently. <laughs> this is what I hear. Yeah, I found him very scary. So did, you, did you sit at home tearing the heads off jelly babies and things like that? <laughs> Sticking pins in Well, I, so, I ate them very aggressively. <laughs> <laughs> So. No, the jelly babies actually, like a lot of these sort of fashionable little things that get picked up in a TV programme, <coughs> the jelly babies had been dropped long before I was in it, actually. Yeah, right. He gave up offering jelly babies, oh, years before. I, that's a part of the early Tom. Hmm. By the time we got to me, the jelly baby, and the yo-yo had also gone. Hmm. So lots of those things that people immediately think of. No, he wasn't handing out jelly babies to anyone. Not in State of Decay, he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Not in my programme. I was aware how... It, such what a clever man he is, and I just felt incredibly stupid. I was just frightened of saying anything in case he d I just got that withering look. Yes. So I, I kept I kept very quiet, and he he also I happened to mention someday I don't know why that I was born in Basingstoke, and from then on he just called me Miss Basingstoke. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. You yes, remember that? I, I, I remember your I'm, face I think when you were called Basingstoke. <laughs> you didn't like it. Did no, you? I didn't. No. Like it. <coughs> no. Uh, I find it a bit scary. Mm. Uh, Terry, you were in a, a somewhat different position coming in for one, one story. How did mm. you feel coming into this established show? Uh, well, I was very, I was very, very welcome. I mean, you know, um, <coughs> um, I mean, yeah, you've got the doctor and you've got um, the companions, but everybody else in the cast were, you know, like me. They were new boys on the set. Uh, basically, I mean, uh, apart from obviously Dalek operators have been doing it for a long while, um, but uh, you know everybody else, you know, uh, uh, people like you know all the rest of the cast. We were we were all in the same kind of boat, you know. And I, I suppose I got a bit of extra kind of help and encouragement from from the production team because I was taking over, and there was a lot of work had to be done in creating a new mask and talking through the chariot and all that, how that was going to work, you know. And, and I had worked with Matthew Robinson, you know, for six months before, so I knew how he worked and he knew what he wanted me to give him, you know. Um, we talked about that before I even got near the rehearsal rooms, you know. But, um, but it was fascinating. I mean, I think my, uh, one of my abiding memories of that was just before the producer's run, which we used to have at the Hilton. Yeah. <coughs> and um, we'd all been up for lunch, you know, and... JMT was coming in in the afternoon and I went down to just have a go, quick look through my script and the room, place was empty, just three Daleks sitting in the corner, you know, and, um, and I wandered across the room and as I walked past the Daleks, the eye stalks all moved and followed me. <laughs> oh, there was a kind of a moment of, oh, no, these are my boys, that's okay. <laughs> no, just, uh, they, they'd actually got in their things ready to, ready to do the, the run. But, uh, yeah. uh, and then Dad, just, sorry. sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, because Davros is such a fantastic mm. part, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Because the part that everybody wants in a Doctor Who story is the villain. It's yeah. always the everybody. We have to go around being nice. nice. And, yeah, yeah. Or at least I'm sort of, my character's sort of semi-nice. He goes through phases of not being so nice. But, but he isn't Davros. He yeah. doesn't sort of sit there all hunched and press buttons and make things explode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everyone, and I'm just dying to do Davros. Yeah, yeah. No, da no, I, no, I, I shouldn't say that to you, should I? No, you can. <laughs> but, um, I shall no, exterminate you, you later. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> don't worry about it. Um, but, uh, he's yeah. such a fantastic... Character. Villains are so much more yeah. fun to do. I yeah. mean, and I, I, I do feel for you know people who have to rush around looking you know and simper and shriek <laughs> and go oh dear doctor and make silly plot suggestions you know to yes. move the plot on rather than actually doing anything heroic you know. Whereas you know if I just sit in my laboratory you know boiling bodies and things, mm. which is much more fun. Mm. And of course, on each of your subsequent returns, there was a new cast, so it must have got to the point where you, in, you were welcoming them to your show, the Davros show. Yeah. Well, I mean, funnily enough, the second one, um, Revelation, was almost the Davros show. I mean, when you look at it, the Doctor hardly appeared. Mm. It was all centred around Davros in, in, in this necros, you know, chamber, you know, where you've got all these cybernetic bodies that you're turning into Daleks. And, you know, Colin flitted around on the outside and eventually came in for a denouement towards the end, you know, and a fantastic cast, you know, with people like William Gaunt and, and um, you know, Clive Swift and, and, and Eleanor Braun and, 
uh, an incredible cast that they'd got together for that, and plus, you know, Graham Harper directing it in his own inimitable and brilliant fashion, you know. So, uh, yeah, that was very much a Davros, Davros one. And then the third one I did was um, purely by accident. I very nearly didn't do it, because I was actually working for Central at the time on a, on a series up at uh, Nottingham. And they had to fight for me. JMT had to fight to get me on lease Len from Central. You know, so I'd <coughs> rehearse with the BBC in the morning and then go off and film with Central in the afternoon. It's a nice position to be as an actor, isn't it? Well, yeah, That's I've never had anybody fight over me before <laughs> at all. No, it never happened since. Um, but uh, it meant I could only do one day in the studio. So, in fact, I was meant to be doing the voice of the battle computer as well. So that everyone thought it was Davros. But uh, they got John Leeson in to do that because obviously I wasn't available for studio. But, um, yeah, so great time. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah. I worked with Clive Swift once or twice, and he, um, he actually said to me after he'd done that, he said, I knew I'd made it when I had been in Doctor Who. Yeah. All the stuff that Clive Swift had done, being in Doctor Who was the signal that he had actually made it. It was he an iconic, it, 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 well it is, an iconic show. It mm. always has been, you know. Um, <clears throat> people, you know, it has this iconic status, you know, which now goes back to our time, you know. And, since it's been brought back again, it's, it's re, reinvigorated oh, and yeah. re-engineered that, that status in a whole generation of younger, younger viewers, you know, who are now revisiting the old, yeah. or the classic series, as I like to call it, <laughs> <coughs> um, you know, as they're picking up on stuff and realising that actually we did it better. <laughs> <laughs> now, Sarah, yes. could you help me settle an argument? Um, last summer... I yes. was doing a convention and was um, facilitating a, a live commentary from David Banks, and we were looking at the last episode of Earthshock. Right. And you've, you've been on record several times on commentaries and said how that last scene of Adric's death was incredibly hard to act because inevitably, with the emotions heightened, you get the giggles. It happens. <laughs> we've, all, we've all been there in those situations <laughs> at school or in the awkward situations where you can't giggle. In preparation, I was watching that last episode several times, mm -hmm. and I did notice the very last moment, as you turn away from the explosion, a smile, and I... <laughs> <laughs> and then, this is, this is the argument I have with a friend of mine. I say, you put your head on Janet Fielding's shoulder and sob with laughter. Um, Robert says that you're, you're acting sobbing at that moment. Could you, could, you, could you clarify okay. at that well, point? Well, one thing you don't know about me. I have a terrible memory. Uh. <laughs> um, I really can't remember a thing. Um, I think I obviously have a very strange acting technique if you thought I was smiling, because I don't think I was. Uh, <laughs> Maybe it was a then. grimace. <laughs> no, I'm far too professional. <laughs> Thank you very much for clearing up that argument. And I wouldn't. Why would I be laughing? <laughs> Talking about TV Centre, actually, and you, met, you briefly mentioned TV Centre and it being no more, and I can't believe that place isn't going to be there anymore. It's just because I have such lovely memories. Yeah. I, I was very lucky to work with a lot of the people that I really admired. Um, and one of the programmes I did, I played Alice and Alice Through the Looking Glass um, at the oh. BBC. It was the first ever, how times have changed, it was the first production the BBC had done, which was nearly all colour separation overlay, and of course that tech, this was mm, gone, that mm. technology's way gone now. Um, and I can remember I was 12 years old, and I had the best dress in the BBC, and I, uh, after that it all went downhill, yeah. I was down in the bottom, <laughs> but I had my own dress up, and I had um, the best dress in the BBC, and I, that I will always remember, and I remember walking in, <coughs> To television centre, that that, and it was just everything was happening. There was a real buzz. There were people yeah. about, and you knew all that creativity was going mm. on, and it was so exciting. Again, I thought I was the luckiest twelve-year-old ever to be involved in us and seeing, you know, people all the time. So I didn't really have someone that I thought I would love to work with because for me these people were just coming by naturally and. Mm. I, I thought I was just really lucky. But lovely memories of TV Centre. It's such a shame it's no longer going to be there. I was a clerk for about three minutes at Lime Grove. About three minutes? Well, two months. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I was a clerk at Lime Grove. Do people not feel teary about Lime Grove? 
Nobody feels emotional about Lion Grove. Very early Doctor Who was filmed. It became the sports place, uh, grandstand, and those things were done from it when I was a clerk for about three minutes. But, um, <coughs> but early Doctor Who had apparently been done at Lime Grove. But obviously no, nobody seems yeah. to feel nostalgic no. and sad about Lime no. Grove. No. Well, I'm sorry. sorry no, you I'm sorry you're not, not moved by it. <laughs> They've all been moved to silence, in fact. <laughs> yes. yeah. And they think, Lime Grove? What's Lime Grove? They're all Googling it now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've just been given the sign to say that we're, we're out of time. Oh, really? I'm afraid. We've chatted, we've talked too much. Yeah. I'm just going to throw one more very quick flipping question to you, really. Okay. With obviously the, the huge culture around Doctor Who and the, the memorabilia side of things, is there anything in particular you look back and think, well, oh, I wish I'd kept, say kept, stolen that? And had it? I'd, I did steal <laughs> <laughs> my gold necklace. and. I feel terrible because I can't find it. I keep looking for it everywhere, and, and, and it's gone. Uh, just as a slight aside to that, I'm very miffed that there isn't a Nissa doll. Yeah. Nicola Bryant has had two dolls. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had one. I would like you all to complain. Quite right. Why has Nikki had two dolls? I'm What's she done to have two dolls? I don't know. That's really irritating. I want, I've always wanted an Adric doll. Though I like the fact there's an Adric... I've always, I like the fact there's an Adric chess piece. I, I oh. think that's... Yeah, there's an ad, oh, yes, there isn't a Nissa chess piece. <laughs> <laughs> I love a chess piece. Not a chess piece. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's misery, isn't it? Well, I am a chess piece, which I think is cool. Yeah, that is cool. Did you steal anything during the time of the show? <laughs> yeah, I, I stole two of my fingers. <laughs> that got blown off in the... Uh, in the, uh, in the, the my, my hand got blown off, you know, because they wouldn't let me have the art mark. They took it away and put it on. <clears throat> I think I have got my mask now, but it's it's a it's a one that we did when we uh, we produced the show for stage a few years ago for children in need, <clears throat> and I've got that, and I've got my I've got my hand I used as well. Um, but no, I stole two of the fingers, which came off, and, and Colin got one. Col I I then you gave, gave my the finger. I, no, 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 he took one. <laughs> There was a shot that JNT wouldn't do because after the explosion, Colin pinched one of the fingers and he knew they were going to do a reverse on him and he shoved it up his nose <laughs> and stood there with this green dripping finger hanging out of his nose. And JNT says, no, no, stop, stop, stop. Let's just take that polish again. You know. But, you know, he kept his finger. I gave mine away for charity auctions, you know. So I don't have anything original, original. But I've got, I have got to say, I've got the mask now, which I have at home, which we used, and I've got my hand still. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Matthew, as we, as we seem to be in a confessional now, did you steal anything from the... Uh, from no, the which is quite a bit irritating. Everyone really. else seemed uh, to. Yes, I wish I had <laughs> stolen something, um, but unfortunately I was too honest. But I would like to... <laughs> what I would like to have stolen, is, is if I had a shrinking ray, would have been the TARDIS set. If I'd been able to shrink that down and put it in my pocket, I would have very much liked to have taken the original TARDIS set home. Well, but I, I couldn't, just, just couldn't, wouldn't fit in my pocket. <laughs> I do happen to know from a conversation I was having about an hour ago that um, Stephen over there has your belt, your shoes, and bizarrely, a pair of your socks. Oh, <laughs> 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 yeah, the shoes, the, the shoe socks. Can he have the belt? Yeah. <laughs> and somebody else has got the top <coughs> and the, the trousers, and somebody else again has the badge. One day we should have a convention where there's a reunion of Andrew. <laughs> 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 well, we've got. I don't think I, I would. No, I don't think I'd fit in. <laughs> but um, I wouldn't, no. Thank you so much, guys. I wish we could carry on for longer, but I'm afraid we have to draw it to an end. Please put your hands together for Matthew <laughs> 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 <laughs>